go. There are no amendments. The uh, subcommittee will come to order. At the conclusion of uh, opening statements yesterday, the chair called up H.R. 3021, and the bill was open for amendment at any point. And so this morning, first question is, are there any bipartisan amendments to the bill? Are there other amendments to the bill? Since there are no amendments, the question would now occur on forwarding H.R. 3021 to the full committee. All those in favor will signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. The ayes appear to have it, the ayes have it, and the bill is uh, favorably uh, reported. Yes. Yes. Yes, go, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I move to strike the last word. Uh, I have very strong concerns about the Air Survey Act. This uh, bill would allow data collected by aerial survey to be given equal weight to ground survey data in FERC's pipeline permitting process. But as we heard at the legislative hearing, these data are not equivalent to on-the-ground surveys that have serious shortcomings when identifying environmentally sensitive areas. It also would allow companies to circumvent property owners' rights and could allow the surveying of their land without notification, let alone permission. At our hearing, Mr. Powell, who testified on behalf of the Interstate Natural Gas Association of America, provided written testimony that stated often the first time an affected landowner has face-to-face -face contact with a company is when an agent knocks on their door and asks the landowner to sign a form giving the company permission to begin performing field surveys on their property in order to develop the information needed for the NEPA review and other permits. Based on this, I find it likely that the shift toward aerial surveying would decrease public participation and awareness of potential projects. Property owners may not find out that they will be impacted until much later in the process. So FERC is already able to accept aerial survey data, but other federal and state agencies, including those conducting critical environmental reviews, do not. This bill is not about FERC. It is really about the data that our other agencies are willing to accept as they work on their studies as part of the application process. This bill would circumvent their existing processes. Professor Frankel provided detailed testimony characterizing the quality of data from aerial surveys. His research found that it does not adequately capture wetlands or threatened and endangered plant and wildlife. When it comes to environmental protection and conservation issues, it is clear that these surveys do not cut it, and yet the agencies that are responsible for environmental reviews would need to accept these data and treat it as equivalent. This bill is a solution, I believe, in search of a problem. We heard from FERC that they are not having problems processing pipeline applications quickly. These pipeline applications are moving forward on a relatively steady timeline. Over 90 percent are completed within 12 months. Since 2005, FERC has authorized a lot of natural gas pipeline infrastructure, over 10,000 miles worth of interstate transmission pipelines. What evidence is there that we need to expedite the existing process by skewing it further in favor of companies at the expense of property owners and thorough environmental review? FERC is able to process applications currently at an appropriate speed while allowing for public discussion and thorough environmental review. I fear a transition to primarily aerial surveying would alter that dynamic, promoting expediency at the expense of property owners' rights and environmental protection. I understand there are people that will not support any pipeline projects, but that does not mean that we need to change data collection methods to avoid interacting with impacted landowners. So these people have rights and deserve to be engaged in a public dialogue about the merits of these proposed projects. So again, Mr. Chair, I just want to reiterate my serious concerns with this legislation. And with that, I yield back the balance of my time. And thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Tonko. And uh, we have uh, favorably reported the bill. Is there anyone on our side of the aisle that would like to make any comment on it? OK. So this, uh, that 3021 has been favorably reported. The chair will now call up H.R. 3797 and ask the clerk to report. Is that this? H.R. 3797, to establish the basis by which the administrator <clears throat> of the Environmental Protection Agency shall issue, implement, and enforce certain emission limitations and allocations 
for existing electric utility steam generating units that convert coal refuse into energy. Without objection, the first reading of the bill is dispensed with and the bill will be open for amendment at any point uh, so ordered. Uh, are there any bipartisan amendments? Are there other amendments? Seeing none, the question Mr. will Chairman. now occur on Mr. Chairman. Uh, for what purpose is the gentleman from Pennsylvania? I move to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the Sense Act introduced by Representative Rothless uh, is an effort to help coal refuge plants, most of which are located in my home state of Pennsylvania. For decades, these plants have processed coal refuge left over from mining operations. Pennsylvania has approximately 170,000 acres of coal refuge piles that threaten local water sources and habitats with acid mine drainage. These piles can burn unabated if sparked by, say, an ATV or lightning, releasing harmful toxins into the air, uh, into the air of, uh, in woods and neighborhoods and playgrounds. Coal refuge plants then take this waste coal and they process it for energy. They not only produce power, but they also clean up these sites. Uh, I've seen the incredible environmental benefit of these plants firsthand on a visit to a coal refuge site in my home district. It's like night and day. Unfortunately, like many power plants across the country, these coal refuge plants are struggling to comply with new regulations like the cross-state air pollution rule and the mercury and air toxic standards. And I share Congressman Rothless's support of these plants and the industry more generally and the issue has a history of bipartisan support in my home state. However, I have some aspects of this bill that, that troubled me at this time. Carving out exemptions or setting alternative standards for particular types of power plants from regulation through re legislation, I think, sets an alarming precedent. Uh, this bill would also infringe on states' rights to implement these regulations under the Clean Air Act, as they've done for decades. And, and lastly, Extending the phase one SO2 emission allowances under CASPER for these particular plants, but not increasing the total amount of emissions for the whole state, could actually make it more difficult and more costly for other coal plants in my state to comply with these regulations. This bill simply helps one small sector of the coal industry while potentially hurting the rest. It's, to put it another way, it's, it's Sense Act robs Peter to pay Paul. I think the Sense Act looks to keep coal refuge plants online. And I think that's an important goal. And I want to work with the committee uh, before we get to full committee uh, to see if there's ways that we can address this issue uh, in a way that doesn't hurt the rest of the coal industry. And uh, so at this time, Mr. Chairman, I, I can't support the bill as currently drafted, uh, but I do look forward to working with you in the future on it. Well, Mr. Doyle, back. thank you very much for that comment, and I know that our staffs and Mr. Upton and others look forward to working with you as we go to the full committee with this legislation. Does anyone else seek recognition to discuss this bill? Chairman. Uh, what purpose does the gentleman from uh, uh, Illinois seek recognition? Moon to strike your last word. The gentleman's recognized. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I want to expand on what my colleague, Mr. Doyle, said earlier about the Sense Act and point out some of the other reasons I cannot support this bill. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, as we heard at last week's legislative hearing, coal refuse plants are not different from any other coal plants and therefore should not be subject to less stringent standards under the EPA's mercury and air toxic standards or MATS rule, or given special consideration under EPA's cross-state air pollution uh, rule or the CASPER rule. In fact, Mr. Chairman, EPA has, has observed that some coal refuse plants were already meeting the match standard. Further, as one of the witnesses noticed, noted in last week's hearing, when owners of a coal refuse facility tried to argue to the D.C. Circuit that they couldn't meet the match air pollution reduction requirements, the court unanimously rejected the industry's argument and pointed to clear evidence that coal refuse plants already were meeting the mass limit. The witness also pointed out that if installed, currently available pollution control technology will reduce air toxins 
from coal refuse plants enough to ensure their compliance with the match standard. Finally, Mr. Chairman, I don't support the Sense Act's provision related to the CASPER rule. Put simply, the CASPER provisions are bad policy. They undermine a successful EPA program that addresses pollution from power plants. They create winners and they create losers, and they infringe on states' rights. I cannot support this bill, Mr. Chairman, and I urge my colleagues to vote against it. Thank you, Mr. Rush. Are there uh, the gentleman from Illinois is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Just to uh, just to remind people that th these are these plants are different because they are either remediating environmental hazards or they're going to help remediate future environmental hazards. I'm sure that my colleague, uh, Congressman Rothfuss, would not bring this bill if it wasn't needed to help incentivize and, and get the benefits of generation while doing major environmental remediation in the state of Pennsylvania. So uh, I'm, I'm happy that he has this. I'm glad we're moving it, and I ask my colleagues to support it. Gentleman yields back. Uh, anyone else? Uh, a gentleman from New York is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, our hearing last week on this bill, um, I believe, uh, illuminated fatal flaws in H.R. 3797, the Sense Act. I think Mr. Uh, Rush mentioned some of those flaws. And I'm uh, convinced that uh, the bill should not be approved by the subcommittee uh, because of the flaws. Uh, first of all, the legislation is unnecessary. Um, proponents argue that waste coal plants cannot meet hydrogen chloride or sulfur dioxide emission standards, but the D.C. Circuit Court unanimously rejected that argument in the case White Stallion Energy Center versus EPA, pointing to clear evidence that some waste coal plants are, are already meeting those limits. Secondly, the legislation would remove economic incentives to reduce emissions at waste coal plants because emissions allocations for those plants could not be traded under the cross-state air pollution rule. That would result in less efficient and more costly compliance with CASPER. And finally, uh, there's the state's rights argument that, that many people on the other side of the aisle uh, make from time to time. Section 2B of this bill would interfere with the state's right to determine how to best comply with the requirements of the EPA's cross-state air pollution rule. It favors waste coal burning plants over other in-state power plants. So this bill takes long-standing state authority, transfers it to the federal government, and then uses that authority to pick winners and losers. I don't think it's a good idea, and I urge a no vote. I yield back. The gentleman from New York yields back. Does anyone else seek recognition for a statement on this legislation? Seeing none, the question would now occur on forwarding H.R. 3797 to the full committee. All those in favor will signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. No. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes have it. And the bill is favorably uh, forwarded. The chair will now call up the discussion draft and ask the clerk to report on the Kiln Act. Discussion draft to allow for judicial review of any final rule addressing national emission standards for hazardous air pollutants for brick and structural clay products or for clay ceramics manufacturing before requiring compliance with such rule. Without objection, the first reading of the bill is, uh, of the draft is dispensed with, and the draft will be open for amendment at any point so ordered. Are there any bipartisan amendments? Are there any amendments? Seeing none, the question would now occur on forwarding the discussion draft to the full committee. All those in favor will signify. Mr. Chairman. Uh, chair recognized the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Rush, for five minutes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you so much. Uh, I'm, I'm opposed to this bill, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the BRIC Act extends compliance deadline for the EPA's brick and clay rules until all legal 
challenges are resolved by the courts. The land of rule should not be taken lightly. And so the blanket extension in the Brink Act warrants close scrutiny. I understand, Mr. Chairman, that there are special circumstances related to this particular EPA rule. This rule dates back to 2003, and leading up to the most recent final rule, which was signed into law in 20, September 2015, the brick industry has made good faith efforts to work with EPA and to reduce their emissions. However, the litigation delay in the Brick Act creates a very bad precedent, and I worry about the impact of blanket extension could have, specifically whether we would see frivolous, frivolous rather, litigation in an effort to merely stall and avoid compliance. Moreover, the brick mat rule just became effective on December the 28th, 2015. So we're not even two months into a three-year compliance period, which also has an option of a year extension for installing necessary pollution control. And at last week's hearing, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Henry discussed how his company is approaching compliance with the rule. And Mr. Henry said, we are still investigating our options to determine the best course of action. Rather than hastily approving a bill to indefinitely delay a Clean Air Act rule, something that I do, do not take lightly, Mr. Chairman, I would suggest we encourage the brick industry to continue investigating its options for complying. If compliance issues remain, then I think the appropriate course of action is through the courts, not through legislation. So I oppose this bill and I urge my colleagues to do the same. Gentleman yields back. Uh, uh, Just gentleman briefly. from Illinois is recognized five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Um, Chairman. I think this is a, a good bill, and I think it's, it, it highlights things that, that's happened legislatively and judicially the last couple of years. So the MATS Act, which was a mercury air toxic standard, uh, was put into place. Industry had to comply only to get overruled by the courts. We just had the clean, pair, clean power plan get stayed by the Supreme Court. They, they stayed it because they didn't want to force, have to force the industry to do all the capital investments to meet a standard which may be ruled illegal. So this act is doing exactly what we should do. If, if, the, uh, if the courts rule that this standard is legal and the brick industry should comply, then they have to invest the capital to do it. But if the uh, courts rule that it's not legal and then say, no, you don't have to comply, then, what, then it saves them from the capital investment and maybe the job losses that would have incurred. So uh, if you just follow what's happened on air and courts and legislation over the past three years, it speaks in support of this piece of legislation, and I ask my colleagues to support it. Well, the gentleman yield. I would yield. Hey, I would just like to reiterate that that 2003 regulation in which the brick industry had to comply by 2006 was vacated by the federal courts in 2007, and that was another reason, I believe, that the Supreme Court yesterday on the Clean Energy Plan, or two days ago, said, well, look, let's hold up implementation of some of these regulations until the courts have had an opportunity to uh, make a decision, particularly when they're really controversial. And uh, w so with that, I would uh, yield back the balance of my time. And I, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman yields back. Or, uh, the gentleman from New York is recognized by Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I would like to say on, on, on your, your example, 
um, that courts do have the power on their own to stay the effect effectiveness of regulations under court challenge. And as you pointed out, the Supreme Court just presented a prime example by staying implementation of the Clean Power Plan. Now, I don't agree with what the Supreme Court did, but the fact is the Supreme Court can do that on their own, stay the effectiveness of regulations under court challenge. So they could have done it with, with this uh, as well, and they didn't. So uh, I, I think that uh, the legislation uh, delays implementation of the EPA's brick and clay rules until all legal challenges are resolved by the courts. It creates that in itself, in my opinion, creates powerful incentives for frivolous litigation to stall and avoid compliance with EPA's rules. And I don't think that's something I want to see. And again, I want to say that courts do, do have the power on their own to stay the effectiveness of regulations under court challenge. So the, the court saw so, uh, it, it could have done so, but it didn't. So I just don't think that we should um, uh, use this as a ruse to stall and avoid compliance with the EPA rules. And for that reason, I, I oppose legislation. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Engel. Does anyone else seek recognition? Seeing none, the question would now occur on forwarding the discussion draft of the full committee. All those in favor will signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes have it, and the bill is favorably uh, reported. The chair will now call up H.R. 4444 and ask the clerk to report. H.R. 4444 to amend the Energy Policy and Conservation Act to exclude power supply circuits, drivers, and devices designed to be connected to and power light-emitting diodes or organic light-emitting diodes providing illumination from energy conservation standards for external power supplies and for other purposes. Uh, without objection, the first reading of the bill is dispensed with and the bill will be open for amendment at any point, uh, so ordered. Are there any bipartisan amendments uh, to this uh, bill? Seeing none, are there any amendments to the bill? Seeing none, the question would now occur on forwarding H.R. 4. Chairman, may I speak on the bill? Yes, the gentlelady from California is recognized for five minutes. Appreciate that. Thank you very much. I move to strike the last word uh, to say that technologies that embrace energy efficiency are critical. On a daily basis, we must balance the need for using energy and the need to ensure that our energy consumption is not doing irreparable damage to our planet. And while we need to continue striving to produce clean energy that relies on renewable, non-polluting sources, we must also address the need for increased energy efficiency. The thinking behind this is simple. We need to be able to do more with less. This is where technology is incredibly important, and we need to invest in and support the technologies that are striving to improve energy efficiency while maintaining and improving our way of life. Um, when it comes to lighting, for example, LED technologies are doing just this. In the hearing on this bill, I spoke about the importance of LED technologies to my district. Research into LEDs is an ongoing pursuit at the University of California at Santa Barbara, and Cree Lighting is championing, that's a company that's championing the implementation of this research into employable technologies. Not only are LEDs benefiting residents of this country, these technologies are being exported to provide clean, accessible lighting to people around the world, including access before. However, it's our responsibility to ensure that we're, we are creating a legislative landscape that supports the research development and implementation of these cleaner and more efficient uh, technologies. H.R. 4444 would do just this for LEDs, and I hope we can move quickly through the process of approving this legislation to ensure the continued development application of this technology. Thank you, and I yield back. Well, thank you very much, and we, all, we do thank uh, Ms. DeGette and Ms. Elmers for introducing this legislation, and there's a general lady from North Carolina seek recognition. Yes, and um, I, do I have to move to strike the last word? 
Oh, you're recognized for five okay. minutes. Thank you. And, uh, you know, really, I just want to say first, thank you to the gentlelady from California. This is an important bill and, you know, obviously not easily understood. There's a lot of technical um, components to this, but one that I think that we can all work together on and, and move forward so that we can be providing, you know, good, uh, reliable sources of energy for our consumers, but at the same time cognizant of, of the environment. So, again, thank you. Mr. Chairman, uh, for understanding the importance of this. And um, for those of you who may not be aware, this particular rule change was scheduled to go into effect yesterday. So the um, moving forward on this expeditiously is very, very important so that we can ensure that, that this does not interrupt any other processes. So thank you. And I yield back if anyone else wants the remainder of my time. The gentlelady yields back. Does anyone else seek recognition? Seeing none, the question would now occur on forwarding H.R. 4444 to the full committee. All those in favor will signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. Ayes appear to have it. The ayes have it, and the bill is favorably reported. Chair will now call up H.R. 2984 and ask the clerk to report. H.R. 2984 to amend the Federal Power Act to provide that any inaction by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission that allows a rate change to go into effect shall be treated as an order by the Commission for purposes of rehearing and court review. Without objection, the first reading of the bill is dispensed with, and the bill will be open for amendment at any point. So ordered, uh, this is uh, Congressman Kennedy's bill uh, that will help uh, clarify a problem over at FERC. Are there any bipartisan amendments to this bill? Are there other amendments to the bill or any amendment to the bill? Chair, I move to strike the last word. Chair, recognize the gentleman from New York for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and I'll be, I'll be brief. I want to thank you for bringing the Fair Rates Act forward. Our colleague, Representative Kennedy, has offered a small but, I believe, important change to the Federal Power Act. I do not believe Congress intended to have decisions by FERC or the failure to make a decision result in changes to electricity rates that could not be reviewed. Utilities are consumers who believe that new rates would not meet the fair and reasonable standard should be able to seek a review of the rates. It is a rare occurrence that FERC does not have its full complement of five commissioners in place and that the commissioners are unable to come to a majority decision on an is issue impacting rates, but we know this has happened. Representative Kennedy's bill anticipates this situation and ensures that everyone retains the right to a review of changes in FERC's policies on wholesale markets. With that, I urge my colleagues to support this measure. And with, uh, uh, with my explanation rendered here, I yield back the balance of my time, Mr. Chair. So the gentleman yields back. Are, uh, is there anyone else to seek recognition to speak on this bill? Mr. Chairman, I, I just uh, want uh, to ask for unanimous consent to enter two letters into the record uh, on, in support of this bill. The first one is the APAA letter supporting the Fair Rates Act, and the second bill is NIFA's letter, also it's Northeast Public Power letter, NIFA, uh, to support this. The gentleman is asking unanimous consent uh, without objection, so ordered. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So at this time, the we'll, question now occurs on forwarding this legislation to the full committee. All those in favor will signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, no. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes have it. And the bill is favorably reported. The chair will now call up H.R. 4427 and ask the clerk uh, to report. H.R. 4427 to amend Section 203 of the Federal Power Act. Uh, without objection, the first reading of this bill is dispensed with, and the bill will be open for amendment at any point. So ordered. Are there any bipartisan amendments? Are there any amendments? The question will now occur on forwarding H.R. 4427 to the full committee. Mr. Chairman, I, I must ask for uh, the strike last the word. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. <clears throat> Uh, Mr. Chairman, there are some concerns on this side of the aisle regarding the bill to amend Section 203 of the Federal Power Act. 
Last week, the subcommittee heard testimony from Mr. Menzer, who is the general counsel for FERC, and he uh, spoke regarding serial mergers as a possible concern. Mr. Menzer stated that the commission would no longer have the authority to review and approve mergers with value at less than $10 million, uh, even in situations where the merger took place as one of a series of transactions that extend, exceeded rather than limit in total. While Mr. Menzer also stated that he believed that FERC had other tools available to protect consumers and the public interest if such circumstances arose. Another witness, if you recall, Mr. Chairman, disagreed with this assessment. In that same hearing, Tyson Slocum, Energy Program Director for Public Citizens, noted that this bill has been portrayed as a very innocuous bill that would simply correct a drafting error from the EPA Act 2005 language. However, however Mr. Chairman, Mr. Slocum took a decidedly different view on this legislation and stated that even with mergers or consolidation under $10 million, it is possible that a single facility or contract has the ability to be a pivotal supplier in a given market, providing the owner <coughs> with an ability to unilaterally charge unjust and unreasonable rates. Mr. S Mr. Slocum also testified that rather than setting a minimal monetary threshold for mergers, there may be other factors that should be taken into consideration when deciding what types of consolidations should be exempt from FERC review and uh, FERC review authority. Looking at some of the other factors can help ensure that these smaller serial mergers or seemingly less consequential monetary transactions do not provide an owner with, a, with the ability to unilaterally charge unjust and unreasonable rates. So again, Mr. Chairman, I urge the majority to continue to work with our side to ensure that there aren't unintended con consequences that may result before we strip FERC of its review authority. With that, I yield uh, back unless another colleague would like the time uh, remaining. The gentleman yields back. As, so at this time, I recognize the uh, author of this legislation, Mr. Pompeo of Kansas, for five minutes. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't need five minutes. Uh, look, this is a, an attempt to correct a, a drafting error, at least I, I think it is. Three other subsections have the language one way. This one just missed it. Uh, but regardless of whether it's a drafting error or not, uh, to require FERC to uh, look at small transactions for its jurisdictional facilities uh, makes no sense. It is a, uh, a not a good use of their time, and we ought to clean this up and get it right. And uh, I'm happy to continue to work with Mr. Rush if he's concerned about uh, you know nine million nine hundred ninety nine thousand dollar transactions being done repeatedly over and over again. Maybe we can fix that. Um, but there's, it, it seems to make good sense to bring this section or section, this part of Section 203 in line with the remainder of the legislation. With that, I yield back. Uh, the gentleman yields back. Does anyone else seek recognition to do, uh, speak on this bill? Seeing none, the question would now occur on forwarding H.R. 4427 to the full committee. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, no. Eyes appear to have it. The eyes have it, and the bill is favorably reported. The chair will call up H.R. 4238 and ask the clerk to report. H.R. 4238, to amend the Department of Energy Organization Act and the Local Public Works Capital Development and Investment Act of 1976 to modernize terms relating to minorities. 
Uh, without objection, the first reading of the bill is dispensed with, and the bill will be open for amendment at any point so ordered. Are there any bipartisan amendments? Are there any amendments? Seeing none, the question would occur on forwarding H.R. 4238 to the full committee. At this time, the chair recognizes the gentlelady from California for five minutes. I don't seem to raise my hand at just the right time, but I only have a brief minute or, or a brief word, but I do move to strike the last word uh, in order to say that the language we use clearly matters. The terms we use to identify individuals and groups is vastly important. This bill highlights that we must ensure that the terms used in our laws and our legislation reflect the people they represent and do not remain relegated to a previous era. In other words, we need to update and modernize. I applaud my colleagues for introducing this legislation. Thank you, and I yield back now. The gentlelady yields back. Is there anyone else seeking recognition to uh, discuss this legislation? Seeing none, then the question would occur on forwarding this legislation to the committee. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes have it, and the bill is favorably reported. The chair would now ask unanimous consent that the subcommittee adopt and favorably forward the following bills as described to the full committee. These are all the hydroelectric bills, H.R. 2080, H.R. 2081, H.R. 3447, H.R. 4416, and H.R. 4434. Does anyone object? Seeing no objection, it is so ordered. Without objection, the staff is authorized to make technical and conforming changes to the legislation approved by the subcommittee today. Uh, so ordered. Chairman. Yes, the gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to, um, to, to comment on the last bill, H.R. 4434, which I support. Um, I, I want to uh, I want to say that I am pleased to be an original co-sponsor of this bill, uh, uh, Congressman Chris Gibson's bill, to extend the deadline for construction of a hydroelectric power. Uh, pro I'm sorry, hydroelectric project at the Cannonsville Dam in Delaware County, New York. Uh, our New York colleagues Paul Tonko and Chris Collins are also original co-sponsors, as I am. Uh, New York City has been exploring ways <clears throat> to extract energy from the water that flows through the city's huge reservoir system. The effort was started by Mayor Bloomberg and has been continued by Mayor de Blasio. So far, the city has constructed two hydroelectric facilities that generate low-cost clean energy and produce revenue for the city. In May of 2014, FERC licensed the construction of a third project, a 14-megawatt hydroelectric facility at the Cannonsville Dam. The de deadline to begin construction is May of this year, uh, May 2016, but the licensee needs to make repairs to the dam that will delay the project beyond its deadline and beyond the two-year extension that FERC is authorized to grant. This bill would authorize FERC to extend the construction deadline by eight years so the licensee can make proper repairs to the dam before beginning construction on the hydro facility. It's important that we do this right. The entire New York delegation that has spoken on this is for it, and I urge a yes vote as well, and I yield back the uh, balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Engel. And uh, uh, as I said, the, the staff will make technical and conforming changes to the le legislation approved by the subcommittee today. And without objection, these bills have been reported, so ordered, and, with, and this sta subcommittee stands adjourned.